mom and dad. Happy anniversary. I hope you enjoy this little trip down memory lane that I put together for you. Love you both. There's my beautiful girl. Welcome home. Yes, you are four and beautiful. You, you gonna read to me this time? Yes, you can. Come on, honey, you can do it. You, oh, so close. Try it again. Good job, honey. Go, 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 go. I don't want a picture of the cake. I want a picture of you. Yes, it is yummy. You're beautiful. You do know that. Yes. You better give me. Yes, I can see you. I just wanted to say thank you so much for always loving me and for always believing in me. There's no way I would be the person that I am today if it wasn't for you guys. She really was listening. Hi, my name is Faith. I'm Lauren. My name is Torian. I'm Travis. My name is Cece. Every child needs affirmation. I can't even tell you enough how important it is that parents show affection for their children. I think the best way that my parents showed affection to me was just always being open to conversation, even when it was inconvenient, probably. There was an open line of communication between both me and my parents. They made me feel like I can come to them. It was very easy. Physically, my mother always hugged me. She always kisses me. She feel unloved if I'm not kissing her and loving her. At church, she always calls me her big baby. Like, <laughs> it's kind of annoying, but I feel loved. So even though I'm not exactly close with my mom or dad like that, the church was able to find, figure out what my love language was. And for me, my love language is actually touch. And so that helps to fulfill that for me instead of me going to somewhere going to someone. No matter what I'm feeling insecure about, my mom's constantly affirming what I'm good at. It makes a huge difference. My dad, he shows me that he loves me in his actions. I wrote a paper and I gave it to him and showed him just so he can proofread it. But he went and showed all of his business people and told them how great of a writer I was. He also always comes to my games. He's always there. I did track and cross country in high school. I wasn't the best in the team, and a lot of times I would be frustrated after races. But to see that my parents were there and happy to see me run regardless of how I performed really helped me um, grow in confidence as a person. I'm heavily involved in music, and ever since I was young, uh, my mom made sure I had a piano or a keyboard. When she told me that she loved hearing me play, it made me feel good about my playing. It made me feel more confident. Just even to this day, my parents, they'll, they'll be right there in the audience. If I were a parent, I would definitely say, reach out every now and then. Of course, don't be overbearing because we do want to be alone sometimes, but we don't want to feel alone. So reach out, let, them, let us know that you're thinking about us. The best thing you can do as parents to stay connected with your kids is don't blow up when you find out about certain things. They're terrified of disappointing you. I guess when I disappoint my mom, it makes me feel like I, I disappointed myself. <laughs> For a kid growing up, to have that kind of love and support every step of the way, 
it empowers you to actually believe you can be the type of person that you're striving for. It gives you a lot of hope for your own future. In the area that you could pray for us is definitely in the area of feeling alone or peer pressure of doing the things that we know you didn't raise us to, to do. I know firsthand what high school students talk about. They are not going to sugarcoat anything, so as a parent, why would you sugarcoat things? Yeah, it's going to be awkward for the both of you. It's not going to be easy, but still you need to be showing them that you want to be a part of their life. Go to their games. Go to their parent-teacher conferences. Be a part of their life. Be a parent. My name is Ariel Juberg, and I'm a psychologist. And I've been working in the field for about eight years, specializing with teenagers and women's development. Connecting with your teenager is definitely not easy. It takes a lot of work, a lot of discipline, a lot of feeling like you failed, but trying to get back up and continuing. Not only are the teenagers in process of growing in their identity, parents and adults were in process of growing in our identity. I think it can be really easy, especially working with teenagers, to take it personally if they aren't connecting with you or if they aren't opening up to you or if they're angry at you. The list goes on and on. But to really remember, oh wait, you know what? They're in process, they're learning, they're in this phase of uh, finding their independence but also really, really needing their parents and needing that nurturance and, and love in their life and that they're trying to navigate their way through and that we need to help them through it. So before going deeper into the love languages and um, how each one is so important, it's so important for parents to know that your teenager really, really wants to hear from you and your teenager wants to hear how you feel about them and how you see them. They're looking for a mirror all over the place during this developmental stage, and if they're not hearing it from you, they're gonna hear it from their friends or their peers or social media and so on. So the first love language I'm gonna talk about is words of affirmation. And this one is huge. The parents that I work with a lot, the very first thing that we talk about is the discipline of catching your kids doing something well and um, positive. It can be really easy to just focus on do this, do that, or to kind of keep them in line and make sure that they're kind of doing what you want them to do. But it's a discipline for each of us to, to maybe find five things a day that your child is doing well. Um, and to be specific about it. Even if it's something as simple as cleaning your room, you know, just catch them doing that and tell them about it. What it does for the teenagers to hear these words of affirmation, it just, it fills their love tank and it makes them feel like what they're doing is being seen and being valued. And it communicates to them, hey, you're doing a good job, keep it up. So the second love language I want to talk about is quality time, which is a really important one. What it means is taking the time to give your teenager your full attention. Let them know that you see them and that you're there for them. No multitasking, no kind of just squeezing them in. Um, just to be really, really intentional and sit down and talk to them. And even more importantly than talking to them, listen. Listen, listen, listen. I've worked with a lot of teenage girls and I know a lot of the moms have, have always come in and been concerned of, well, I don't wanna be this nagging mom and asking too many questions and you know, my daughter's so annoyed by me asking all these questions all the time. But when I sit one-on-one -on -one with the daughters, it is the complete opposite. When their parents stop asking them questions and stop spending time with them, their heart breaks. They may say it's annoying, but they do not believe that it's annoying. And they may communicate to you that it's annoying, but they don't feel that way. They really, really want to hear these things. They really want your time. They really want to know that um, they're important. 
So there are words of affirmation, quality time, and now I'm gonna talk about physical touch. There's definitely a time, a place, a manner for physical touch. But if your child is one who likes physical touch, you have to take the time to kind of learn, learn what it is through their teenage years. Maybe it's changed from a hug to a high five or maybe a side hug or it takes a lot of kind of reading your teen and, and really asking them to. It can be really, really uh, common for fathers to feel like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know how to hug my daughter, touch her. I don't feel like she wants anything to do with me. She's growing, changing. It's just, it's, you know, it's a new ball game. But that research over and over again has, you know, just speaks to the importance of dads really being a part of your daughter's lives and giving them physical touch and telling them how much you love them and how beautiful they are. And um, that physical touch during the teenage years from a father is really important. So the next one is um, acts of service. Parents, you're doing this anyway. You're driving them places, you're cooking them meals, you're doing their laundry, um, kind of the day-to-day -day things that they can't really do for themselves, but that it really means so much for them that you do that. You're attending their games, you're attending their special events. Just being a part of their life and serving them. The last one I'm gonna talk about is gifts. And this can be a very tricky one, especially our world today um, has a lot of material items and there's so many things that can kind of replace true love. The key for giving gifts is, and if your child you know, really responds to giving gifts, is getting to know them, getting to know what's really special to them and bringing ceremony into the process of giving gifts. Maybe present it to them in front of the family or just to kind of make a big deal out of it. Like, you, you've been doing great, like, and I'm so proud to be able to give this to you. I think so much of um, the love language of gift giving is to, as a parent, to really step back and ask yourself where you're coming from when you're giving this gift. You need to ask yourself, is this for the well-being of my teenager? Is this for the well-being of my child? Or am I feeling guilty because you know, I haven't been spending enough time with them. That's not a good, a good time to give them a gift. Or, hey, if I give them this, I'll get them to do that. Not a good way to do gift giving. So not manipulative, not, you know, kind of just buying their affection, but truly asking yourself, okay, is this benefiting my team? And then at the same time, explaining to them why you're giving them the gift. and why you think that it's important. And I think that's the importance of bringing the ceremony around it and not making it just a, an everyday thing. The concept of love language is just the importance of a love tank and just kind of picturing your teenager's heart and how you are feeling it. I guess when you visualize it that way, if you're talking to your child, if you're loving them, if you're trying to connect with them, if you're getting to know them, you're filling them up with love. And that's what we all need. As a kid, just not having a relationship at all with my biological father um, was um, was a big deal. At some point, um, I, I think I started to feel as if uh, he, he, he wanted nothing to do with me. It made an impact on myself and my and my, my brother, um, which led to a, a lot of a lot of things. It grew a lot of arms, 
you know, um, from being upset to um, to being violent to um, eventually becoming promiscuous. I was, uh, I remember, I was about nine years old, and uh, I was uh, um, over at my grandmother's house, and there was a, a guy that um, we we knew um, who, who was next door. We knew there was trust and there was a relationship, as uh, um, him being uh, about 19 years old or so, 18, 19. He was taking kids around and and um, doing piggyback rides or whatever, going around the block and coming back. And uh, <clears throat> it was my turn, and, when, and uh, we ended up uh, going around to the to the garage, and and before I know it, I was uh, uh, being molested in, in the garage, and carried and got back on, and carried me back like nothing ever happened, and uh, and I I think at that point I, I shut down, um, and I just became just completely um, angry, confused questioning everything about myself. And then I set out to, um, to prove that I wasn't a homosexual by having sex with as many girls as I could. I, I met a girl and, and uh, we, um, we started connecting. And so we, we had sex, unprotected sex. And so that led to us um, having, having uh, a son together, which changed a lot of things. You know, for me, um, I, I wanted to be more responsible, but I was scared. I always say that I was really good at a few things, and one of them was running. And so um, it, I, I wanted to run and not be responsible, but um, I warred against that and because of my, my daddy issues and, and, and was able to be there. Maybe God wired us not only to to be connected to our mothers and, and want our heartbeat to beat with theirs. And I think there's something there with the father as well. I remember um, being 30 years old. I get word that, uh, that my biological father's in town. At that time, I'd seen him maybe, um, five or six times in my life. But I heard he was in town, and I heard that he was going to come by the church. And so I, go, I remember sitting in the front pew, um, getting ready to go preach. And, I, and I'm doing this, and I'm looking behind in the aisle, he's, you know, and this, and uh, he never showed up. So to think that the effects, ramifications of a father not being there and the behaviors that we have is, is the biggest proof. If I could look back at myself and any other kid in that type of situation, I would uh, tell them that they do have a father, uh, that God the Father uh, does love them, as corny as that may sound sometimes. It's the reality. He does, and uh, it's a historical fact that he loved us so much that he would send his only baby boy for us, for me, the broken me, and the broken you. And then I would say, seek him out every single day and he'll, he'll show you where to go and he'll show you who he is. My 17-year-old daughter, um, I have to take her to school. The other two take the bus. And that 15 minutes in the car every morning, I look forward to it. That way we can talk, mm -hmm. you know, no one but me and her. And we can share. And I can um, talk to a, a group of men recently. And I said, how many of your children even know your political views? And not one raised their hand. Say, so your child, you know, they don't even know how you feel, how you, what, your stance on abortion or anything that's important. They don't know it. You know, and you're losing their heart at that point. They should know these things and how you feel and, and, and kind of where you're, you're headed and, and what your plans are. So we get to have those conversations. And she said, Dad, you know, you know she asked these questions. And you just want to be there to answer them because not someone else 
is going to answer them for you. Yeah, <laughs> right. And cool. it won't be the answer you might want what them to have, you know. I put notes in their lunchbox every day. And most of the time it's riddles and, you know, whatever it is. And then it says, I love you, mom. So that, you know, whatever kind of day they're having, they know when they get to lunch, they're going to get some sort of special note from me. I really, really love my daughter. She's in right now. She's the oldest in the house. So I just don't want her to rush. Man, I, I really want her to wait to date and I make sure that that I tell her I want her to wait to date because real love takes time. And we know that, you know, just from being um, married for a number of years, you just don't know everything up front. And the world that we live in right now, especially everything that's on TV and just um, the atmosphere, they want you to hurry up, hurry up, make a quick decision. And I'm like, no, you know, just wait. It's in your best benefit to just wait. And at first she was a little against it because a lot of her friends in school are going really fast. But some bumps and bruises show her, you know what, I'm just going to wait. And I was just so proud of some decisions she made to just say, hey, you know what, I'm not ready for that. And, you know, you just have to trust that just your affirmation of, listen, I think you should wait. And then their experiences <laughs> will show them that waiting today is definitely a good choice. So our daughter is 17 and um they she knows that I am the access to any of the guys. And so and so if I hear that there's a guy that wants to ask her out or if a guy does ask her out, her first answer is uh, you're talking to the wrong person. You got to talk to my dad. And uh, then she can tell me and I can say, do you want me to say yes or no? And if she wants me to say no, I don't mind being the bad guy. Right. I'll say no to any boy. But I tell her I still get veto power because if I like him, I'm going to let him take you out. <laughs> um, but uh, but but we had one of those, uh, you know, those conversations with her because I wanted her to know that I, that I valued her and she was a, she was a gift to us and she's going to be a gift to her husband. And we wanted to, uh, again, affirm her value so that um, when some guy came looking around, um, she knew she didn't need him to, to be affirmed and to be loved because she got that from her from her dad and from from her mom as well. I had a guy, um, a friend of mine at work was telling me um, he came into a situation where he he looked at his son's cell phone. There was a text and um, it said that they were going to go over to the friend's house and, and Netflix. Netflix and chill is what they That's call it. That's it, Netflix and chill. Yeah. I mean, we're going to Netflix and chill. <laughs> and, and his wife panicked, was like, what? You know what that means? I think keeping open communication with our kids is really important. I think that's how um, you show that you love them. Doug asked our kids the other night, so what are kids saying for this? Or what does this mean? Or how do you communicate that? And I think that's important. So as they get older, your language develops with them and we know what they're talking about and what their friends are talking about and they feel comfortable sharing that and at the dinner table we'll talk about anything you know so they know it's a safe place that they can ask mom and dad questions and then we can set boundaries or s say this is what we as a family have established as the rules and the guidelines that's the best protection you can give your child mm -hmm. is that 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 open door policy where they can talk to you conversation is the protection for your children mm -hmm. that way you know their hearts you know what they're thinking some of the things that I do to help with, with or that we helped with our kids in uh, creating some of that, because they, they only joined our family five years ago, um, was to, from the very beginning, um, to remind them what our role was, and that's to provide for them, to prepare them for life, and to protect them from harm. And so we couch everything in those three terms. Our son struggled with lying, um, especially when he moved in, and he didn't get why that ruined anything. I said, dude, when you lie to us, our relationship is busted. And I said, also, when you lie to me, I'm working with wrong information. So when you lie, I'm no longer able to do my job. I can't provide for you because I'm working with the wrong information. I can't prepare you for life because I'm preparing you for the wrong things. I can't protect you because I don't know what I'm fighting. And so that's one of the things that for us and our family that you can ask any of our, any of our kids, uh, what is the role of your parents? And say to provide, to prepare, to protect. And so from the beginning, that was what we worked on hard so that there could be that, that consistency. With our oldest, because when we got married, our oldest was seven. So of course he let me do everything for him at that time. But the older he got, it's like he started really realizing that I wasn't his biological mom and that he really kind of didn't trust me anymore. Didn't trust me to maybe um, rear him in the right 
way, didn't trust me to protect him, didn't trust me to love him. And so he just started making a whole lot of mistakes, you know. And so for me, it was really hard because I, I did love him, you know, just like he was my own and I wanted to treat him that way. However, I just had to kind of let him make those mistakes and then just love him through them. And that was difficult because like my <laughs> husband said, women, I mean, for me, I didn't want them to make any mistakes. I mean, what mother does want their child to make mistakes, but just because of the positioning that we had, you know, from a blended family and me having to almost prove over again that I loved him and all that. As they go out the door, you need to pray for them. Just because they're inside your four walls doesn't mean that they're safe either. Right. Um, we have wireless internet at our house and most homes do now. And those devices are in the pocket all the time. And it's a scary world out there. And it's, it, but then it's even scarier when that outside world comes in and um, protecting our kids from that. It's as a youth pastor, I deal with a lot of the kids in our youth group that are struggling with this. Parents come to me, hey, how do we help with this? We didn't know this was here. And all of a sudden it's all over my kid's iPad. Like, well, one, don't freak out. I already did. Okay, so, <laughs> all right. So let's, let, let's try to mend some bridges and let's work through this. But one of the things that we do in our family is we don't allow those devices inside the rooms with the door shut. It's so funny to me because I told them when they got their phones, no codes on the phone, no codes. I don't care that you go to school and you don't want your friends to get, no codes on the phone. So at any given time, I should be able to pick the phone up and look in it as freely as possible. Now, if I pick the phone up and there's a code on it, then however long it takes me to figure the code out, that's when you'll get the phone back. So they're like, no, mom, the code is, no, I don't wanna hear it. I don't, I don't wanna hear, you know, because we just, I just have to tell them, look, this is really our phone and you're just, you know, using it. There's nothing that we should not be able to know. Now, if you had told me the code, hey, mom, we have a problem around our school, whatever, I put a code on, or is it okay if I put a code on? This is the code. Okay. But all three of them had codes on it, and I didn't have them. So guess what? I still have the phones, and it's been a week. So they're like, oh, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> but They're so miserable. They talk to me now. <laughs> <laughs> I am dead serious. PRC roundtable, scene one, take two. Well, one thing um, that I do in our house is I watch all the time. I watch for behaviors. You know, I watch to see if my children are being more isolated than they would normally. Cause like my husband said, they're really bubbly and always open. But if I see them, you know, just constantly, Hey, let me go to my room or let me just do some things on my own. I'm like, do you have your phone? Um, yeah. Okay. Bring the phone upstairs and then you can go downstairs and read. And they're like, Oh, okay. You know, so just, um, um, behavior changes is, is, is major because it's almost evident that when something is not going right, something in their countenance is going to change, you know, and, and if you watch them, you know, being their parent, you'll be able to know and pick up on certain things. And we had a crash course in the phone. And for me, I know for a fact with that, with the oldest boy, when he turned 15 or 16, we got him his own phone and he was real quiet all day. Like my wife said, way beyond normal. So my wife said, hey, we were in the van. Pass your phone up here. Oh, man, he got real chatty then. Really? You know, he had a whole lot of conversation. You know, like, ah, yeah, something in there you don't want us to see. Mm -hmm. Adult women. I mean, he was 16. We talking women 22, 23 years old, you know, were having real conversations with him. Like, I'm like, yeah, you gotta be kidding me. So of course she threatened him out there. She called him, she called him all, you know, like, mm -hmm. do you know this is a teenage boy? I'll mm -hmm. have you arrested. But it's that mood change, mm -hmm. you know, how he's, how he's carrying himself now. You know, do we talk now? Do we, do we shut down even more? Like my wife said, mm -hmm. and, and we went through those, you know, we went through everything we could um, to get to get him to where he is now. My lifestyle was a lot different. Um, and so I educate him with the knowledge that I have, you know, this is what it's done to me, you know, and, and he's like, no, I don't want to be anything like that. No way, dad, <laughs> you know, but it's, you know, and I, I explained to him the, the faults of mine 
and where things mm-hmm. came from and how I struggle with certain things, you know, yeah, and I, too. and I'm like, look, this, this is the stuff I don't want you to have to see or deal with. And he appreciates it. The transparency. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, and that's key. That's, it goes back to that same thing. We started with that conversation. You got to talk to them. They got to get to know you. Um, they they got to know that you're real. When I was 16, I had an older cousin. He took me to a strip club, 16 years old. I had this beard and everything, right? So I looked 21. <laughs> I've never seen a naked woman like before in my life, you know, inside this strip club. And I tell my, I will tell my sons the story. I have no problem doing it. And I had like $20 in singles, all right? It, in less than 60 seconds, she had all 20 of my singles. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I go back to my cousin like, I need more money. I need more money. She liked me. You know, I need to give her, and I said it just like that. And I'll never forget, he said, he looked me right, he said, man, she do not like you. She just want to keep taking your money. And I couldn't process that then. I was only 16. I wanted 20 more dollars so I could give her 20 more singles, you know, and um, having those stories and telling my children, this is what this is what that feels like. No, that person don't want you. They don't want any part. They want something from you. So I think something that's helpful with with my kids when we talk about the sexual relationship is that it is it's one of giving. We always say like to the teens and our own children, God created us as sexual beings. Like that's how we were designed and that there's a purpose and there's a reason and there's within God's bounds that is good. And then there's outside of that, which can lead to disaster and tragedy and all these things. And so I think for them to realize, yeah, you're a sexual being, that's okay. And that's okay that you have, you know, hormones raging, that's normal. But what do we do with that? How do we channel that? How do we work through those things? And I think that's important. And then even looking back at, you know, masturbation, pornography, recognizing the ramifications of making decisions outside of God's bounds. We can dehumanize other people and we can start not being able to have conversations with the opposite gender because they've only been on a page before on the internet or on our phones. And so recognizing you are a sexual being, that's true and that's okay. So then what do we do with that? And I think that's important as parents for us to be able to have, again, the open dialogue where our kids can ask us, what is masturbation? Well, what does that mean? And some of those conversations can be really uncomfortable. Thus why one of our children will say, do we have to talk about this again? But we want them to know that's okay that you have these questions and that your friends are talking about this. We want you to be able to come and talk with us and then we can direct you, your mind, your thoughts, and just really refocus and recognize, yes, it's okay, but what do we do with it? Yeah, you have to let them know that they're normal, that those feelings are normal, that everybody goes through it, everybody has them, and it's what you do with them that that matters. There's so many different ways we're trying to protect our kids. You know, we talk about the internet and those sorts of things, but even peer pressure and that kind of stuff is um, so dangerous, um, almost more dangerous because there's actual flesh and blood that you're having to say no to. Um, it's not just a figure on the internet, it's actually a real person. And so what are some of the things that you guys do when it comes to protecting your kids? Well, before they even get around um, their friends, just within our house, I like to play the what if game with them. So what if you were in this situation, how would you react? Because sometimes, you know, you think in your head, oh yeah, if I was in that situation, I would know exactly what to do. But for me, um, to be able to hear it come out of their mouths and for them to even think about it would say, you know, oh, huh. So if I was at someone, someone's house and they started doing drugs, what would I do? You know, and so I sit there and wait on the answer, you know, and my son is like, well, I would, you know, and I think he just wasn't prepared to not know exactly what he'd do. And he didn't really have to give me a distinct answer. I just wanted him to know that those are some situations that you may be in. And if you're in them, what do you do? You know, so just thinking that through playing those games really helps to to get their minds thinking. And then just letting them know that um, standing alone is okay. You know, because sometimes you think that if you're 
in a group of people, you don't want to be the outcast doing something different than everybody else is doing. Just really praising the situation of being alone, you know, and I, yep. Mm -hmm. And I use myself as that example. I'm like, man, you know, it's, it's lonely sometimes standing by yourself, but if you know that you're standing for the right thing, then go ahead and do it. Yeah. I just was having that conversation with my kids this past week and just, they'll come home and tell stories about what they did or how they s stood and then other kids would stand with them and then they weren't by themselves. And the more I think our kids learn to practice that, the more it becomes a habit and then they become more confident in who they are. So if we can encourage that at home and have those conversations, I think that's critical. But then also letting them know that there is an out, that they can talk to us or they can call or text or whatever if they're in a situation and get a hold of us and that we're there to help them too, but we're cheering them on. Now, I've really enjoyed this time talking together, talking about communication, talking about listening, um, affirming our kids and those kinds of things. And it's been one of those things for me that, um, again, the reminder that my responsibility as a father is to provide for my kids what it is they need, um, to prepare them for life, uh, to protect them from harm, whether it's outside the home or inside the home. That's our chief responsibility as mom and dad. We are in Allendale, Michigan. Unusually warm November night. I don't know an American dialect for this, so it's pretty tough. I'm just kidding, I'm American. <laughs> then you can look back and go, I'm gonna let it She says serious. All right, guys, I'm serious. Hello, I'm Jim Spray. Steve Seiler. Maggie Flynn. Even when it doesn't feel like it, you are still their greatest influence have to have numerous amounts of conversation with your child. Oh, it's your parents. Don't give up on your kids. My tragedy has become my testimony. Let them know your love is there and it's solid. It makes a huge difference.